Good morning. Grace and peace be to you from God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the online edition of First Presbyterian Church Worship in Pilot Mountain for August 16th, 2020. A couple of announcements for this morning. There is a session meeting on Monday night at 7 p.m. If you have anything that you would like to see on the agenda, please contact myself or one of the session members. For pilot outreach this month, they are asking for fruit snack packs, mixed fruit, applesauce, mandarin oranges, peaches, etc. If you have any questions about that, please contact Deb Alfred or contact pilot outreach uh, themselves. If you would join me now for our call to worship printed in your bulletin. God has forgiven us and drawn us close, who has lavished upon us the fullness of the blessed Holy Spirit. With glad and grateful hearts, praise the Lord. Scripture says if we say that we have no sin, then we are found to be lying, and God is not with us. So let us join together in the unison prayer of confession, confessing our sins before God and each other. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. We are tormented. Our lives have been disrupted by the devil and by our own devilish desires and evil exploits. We are dismayed at your presence, anguished by the awful fallout of our own failures. We cannot take back what we have said or undo what we have done or atone for the agony that we have caused. We are haunted by the past, plagued by the present, and fearful of the future. We shrink away from your gaze as strangers outside your circle of blessing. Yet the faith you have planted in us reaches out for your favor returns to your presence, and hungers for your mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our God, show our God showers us with kindness, forgiving our sins, preserving our lives, and restoring our souls through the abundant provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive now that for which faith has hungered. You are forgiven and healed in the name of Jesus the Christ. Thanks be to God. And if you would join me for our unison prayer for illumination, let us pray. Merciful Savior, your suffering has saved our lives, secured our future, and restored us to relationship with God. Remove the shame and fear that cause us to cower in your presence. By the power of your Spirit, open our eyes and hearts to your word of love, mercy, healing, and blessing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 113. And listen now to the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high? Who looks, down, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? who raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and with princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of her children. Praise the Lord. And from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, is it not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs? She said, Yes, Lord. 
Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. And our second reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 1 to 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to, to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither planting nor harvest, nor plowing. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring down my father here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked to him. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The end of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat is a true spectacle. Joseph meets his father and receives back his coat. Then he breaks into any dream will do with his father and brothers now reconciled, joining him. It's a great end of the musical, but is this how the story ends? One wishes it were so. There is forgiveness and there is reconciliation, but there is also uncertainty and fear. There is a time when we believe that this will be Joseph's moment to stick it to those who had caused him so much pain. And he would have been, in our opinions, perfectly in his rights to do so. But before we get to this section of text, this section of the story, we need to cover a bit of ground to see just how we got here. You see, we have skipped over eight chapters of text, seven of which relate to Joseph in Egypt. And in these chapters we meet Joseph, who is a conscientious slave, such a good worker and so honest that his master puts him in charge of his whole household. But then his master's wife tries to seduce him, and when that fails, she accuses him of rape. And being just a slave, Joseph is thrown into prison for his crime. Now in prison, he is again such a model prisoner that the warden basically turns the whole prison over to him. And while there, he interprets dreams for two men in Pharaoh's employee, which proved to be true. One is released, while the other is hanged. The one who was released forgets about Joseph when he goes back to his job, but two years later remembers him when Pharaoh takes to dreaming himself. Now Joseph is called into service to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, and he tells them that seven years of plenty are going to be followed by seven years of famine. Now, famine was, and still is, a very serious calamity to occur to any people. There would be starvation, there would be population decline, and there would be a weakening of a nation of which others would take advantage. To have seven years of famine would be devastating to any nation, but particularly to Egypt, which was a powerful empire and wished to maintain its place at the top of the hierarchy of nations. 
So Pharaoh brings Joseph into the government and makes him his chief advisor, telling him to take care of the project to save the country. Joseph again shows his administrative talents by taking in grain during the good years, so much that it was like grains of sand and they lost count of how much was stored. And now we come to the interesting part. The famine hits Jacob and his family as well. Ten of the brothers traveled to Egypt because they had heard there was food there and, well, they need some. When they meet Joseph to negotiate a price, they bow down to him not knowing who it is and that they are fulfilling the dream that they had tried to thwart so many years before. But Joseph knows them. He claims they are spies and he holds one of them hostage to have them bring Benjamin, his full brother, back to Egypt. After some time, the brothers must go back to get more food. They take Benjamin with them and find that they must face another test. Benjamin is accused of stealing and faces death. Judah, who if you recall was the one who suggested the selling of Joseph into slavery, steps forward and pleads for his brother's life, even willing to give his own for him. Joseph sees how much his brothers have changed and reveals himself to them. And this is where our text begins for today. Joseph's revelation causes his brothers to be speechless. The dead one is alive. The one they had thought lost has been found. And in a powerful position, no less, a powerful position where he can settle the score. Who would not have been rendered speechless, if not from amazement, then from fear? But Joseph calls them to come closer. He bridges the gap between them and asks about his father. He states to them that they had meant harm, but God used it for good to preserve life. There is no shaming, no recriminations, no, think of what you did. No, Joseph is forgiving and wishes to be reconciled with his brothers. He gives God glory for what has happened to him through his situations. He states in verses 5, 7, and 8 that God sent me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph is telling them that they are saved because he wants reconciliation and not revenge. Because God had sent him to do the good work that is being done. Hugo Magalanes says this about the scene. This stands in clear contrast with current understandings of secular or legal justice. Given his, given his circumstances and all that he endured, many of us would be able to understand and perhaps even justify it if Joseph's reaction was one of seeking some form of retribution for what had been done to him, betrayed, attempted murder, sold into slavery. Shockingly, there is no sense of revenge or an indication toward retributive justice by Joseph. Rather, his explanation is based on an understanding of salvation as extending God's blessings, grace, and looking for ways to restore everyone involved. Magdalenas calls this restorative justice in which all parties involved, victims and wrongdoers, are brought back into a restored relationship. But Joseph is also using a bit of his power here. He commands his brother to bring his father to him. He is a bit paternalistic to them, telling them that he will take care of them during the famine. He also tells them where they are to live. No, the reconciliation with the older brothers is there, but it is not yet complete. That comes later in the story. And now the only brother with whom there is full reconciliation is Benjamin. This is the brother who had no part in the plot and who is Joseph's only full brother. Both brothers embrace and weep, and after this Joseph embraces the rest of his brothers, and it is only then that they find their tongues and begin to speak. We have all had something bad done to us by, by someone. Some things that are not that bad while others are unspeakable. And in those times, there can be something good that comes out of it. As with Joseph, God can take the evil done to us and turn it into good. But does that mean we should always shrug our shoulders and say, well, well, God can make something good out of this? Absolutely not. We are humans and we can make decisions to do evil. 
Like the brothers, the evil we perpetrate will come back to haunt us. It may be racism, it may be classism, it may be any ism or anything else that divides us from our brothers and sisters in Christ, and even from those who are in our neighborhoods. We have human agency, and that can cause a great deal of pain and guilt. But God is the ultimate authority, and that what happens in our lives does not stymie God's purposes. What God wants to happen will happen, no matter what we do to prevent it. Look at Joseph and his brothers attempt to put an end to the dreamers so that his, the dreams would not come true. Just because they wanted an end to them did not mean that they would not be fulfilled. When we put our full trust in God, the bad things that have happened to us can be turned into good. But that full trust also causes us, calls us to be reconciled with those who have done the bad things to us. Can we be like Joseph and reach across to the ones who did us wrong? May God give us the strength and the wisdom to do so. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. So let us state what we believe in the faith of our in the creed for our baptism. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you turn to page 6 of your bulletin, you will see the list for all of our prayers of the people. And so let us now turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of healing and mercy, you are Lord of all, embracing the estranged, blessing the banished, reconciling the rejected. We cry out to you now, confident that your provision is abundantly more than enough to preserve the church, redeem the world, and deliver the tormented. Lord, help us. We trust in you. For your people, the house of Israel, and the household of faith near and far, Lord, Help us. We trust in you. That the church may replicate your reconciliation, model your mercy, and herald your healing for all. Lord, help us. We trust in you. For unity and harmony to flow freely among your creatures and throughout your creation. Lord, help us. We trust in you. For reconciliation and new beginnings among estranged families, races, nations, and peoples, Lord, help us. We trust in you. For healing for those who are tormented, rejected, marginalized, fearful, forgotten, cast off, Lord, help us. We trust in you. For those whose names we now lift in your presence, silently or aloud, Lord, help us. We trust in you. For our ancestors in the faith, now kept in your care, and never to be forgotten by you, Lord, help us. We trust in you. We stand in your circle of favor, embraced by you, healed by you, blessed by you, remembered by you, secured by you, grateful for your loving care, and for the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge. May you see Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see Christ in you. And hear the blessing. The God who forgives, reconciles, heals, and blesses is with you today and forevermore. Amen.